And in the presence of Christ is worth a thousand years in the presence of a preacher. I'll just say that. One syllable from Christ does more than a hundred books by a writer. And I love preachers and writers. I am one. But I am under no illusion that my word can change a person. But just a whisper from the King of Kings can bring healing and hope that is supernatural and deep and eternal. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's get to work. Here's what you need to know about the walls of Jericho. They were immense. And they wrapped around the city like a suit of armor. Two concentric circles. Circles of stone. Rising 40 feet above the ground. They were impenetrable. And here's what you need to know about Jericho's inhabitants. They were ferocious and barbaric and they withstood all sieges. They repelled all invaders and they were guilty of child sacrifice. They were a Bronze Age version of the Gestapo, ruthless tyrants on the plains of Canaan. Until the day that Joshua showed up, until the day that the army marched in, until the day that the bricks cracked and the boulders broke, until the day that everything shook, the stones of the walls, the knees of the king, even the molars of the soldiers. And the untoppable fortress met the unstoppable force, and mighty Jericho crumbled. But here's what you need to know about Joshua he didn't bring the walls down, God did. Now Joshua never swung a hammer. Joshua never dislodged a brick. God did that for Joshua, and God will do that for you. Your Jericho is your fear. Your Jericho is your anger. Your Jericho is your insecurity, your anxiety, your proclivity to overanalyze or crit criticize or compartmentalize. Your Jericho is any mindset or attitude that keeps you from moving into your promised land. And in order for you to move forward in your faith, the walls of Jericho must come down. That is true for you and that was true for Joshua. The setting of Joshua is 1400 BC. The children of Israel had spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then about 1400 B.C., God spoke, Joshua listened, the Jordan River opened, the Jericho walls came down, the sun stood still, and 31 kings went into early retirement. <laughs> Evil was booted out and hope was rebooted. These were the glory days of Israel. Seven years on the timeline of your scripture in which the children of Israel were for all practical purposes un beatable. These were the glory days of Israel. Maybe you could use some glory days yourself. I had lunch with a friend not too long ago who described his spiritual life with the phrase midlife misery. He said, I can't remember the last time I had an answered prayer. And he said, I struggle with the same temptations that I struggled with 20 years ago when I was baptized. My friend's not alone in the wilderness. According to one recent survey, about 89% of Christians would describe their lives as more life in the wilderness than life in the promised land. Rather than saying they believe they're steadily advancing in their love for God and love for their neighbor, they feel like they're meandering and they're walking in circles. Maybe that describes you. Maybe in your heart of hearts you had hoped that the Christian life would be more than what it is. Why is there a disconnect between what you read in the Bible and what you're experiencing in your life? How can you come out of the wilderness? What do you do when you feel spiritually stuck? I think the book of Joshua is in the Bible to help people who feel like they're in the wilderness. They know they're out of Egypt. They've been delivered from sin and death, but their Egypt is not quite out of them. They're not afraid of Pharaoh, but they're still dominated by fear. And they feel like they're walking in circles. Is it possible for God to bring a generation 
of people out of the wilderness into a season of victory, into a season of glory days. The book of Joshua says yes, and the book of Joshua shows us how. And anyone who has read any part of the book of Joshua has read the story of Jericho. And in many ways, the Jericho story is a trademark story. It's a hallmark story that encompasses all the promises of the book of Joshua. And so I'd like for us to look at it for just a moment. It's in Joshua chapter 6 in verse 2. And it begins this way. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. God did not say, Joshua, you go out there and take that city. Instead, he said, I have given Jericho into your hand. I have taken the city. Now you go and receive it. Already we're picking up a major theme in the book of Joshua. Joshua did not fight for victory. Joshua fought from victory. Joshua did not fight for victory. Joshua fought from victory. Joshua did not live out of circumstance. Joshua lived out of inheritance. Those of you who like to write notes in your Bible, make note of the fact that the word inheritance appears in the book of Joshua about 60 times. It is the theme of the book of Joshua. The theme of Joshua is not Joshua conquered the land. The theme of Joshua is God gave Joshua the land. And Joshua had enough faith to receive it. He received it. He lived out of his inheritance and not out of his circumstance. Do you know that when you gave your heart to Christ, or if you've never done it, when you do give your heart to Christ, something wonderful happens. A supernatural miracle happens. And you go from being just a regular Joe or a regular Judy to becoming a child of the living God. A child of the living God. Behold what love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called not employees of God or just members of the kingdom, but we should be called children of God. Next time you look in the mirror, say, Behold, a child of God, a person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, a person for whom the most precious commodity in the history of the earth was spilled. Behold, a child of God. The Apostle Paul says that not only are we children of God, we are heirs of Christ. Yes, co-heirs with Christ. I'd be happy to be an heir of Christ, to be a distant descendant, to be whenever they pass out the blessings just to pick up the, the leftovers. But the Apostle Paul says we are co-heirs with Christ. We stand in line with the firstborn. And whatever Christ can receive, we can receive. Whatever joy can Christ can receive, we can receive. Whatever strength is available to Christ is available to you. Whatever hope is available to Christ is available to you. We live out of our inheritance, not out of our circumstance. Promised land people get this. Promised land people don't think, well, because I have a problem today, I'm going to have this problem forever. Promised land people see their problems differently. They realize it's just a matter of time before that Jericho comes down. And they're going to press forward in faith. Promised land people do not say, my mom was a gossip, my dad was a gossip, my uncle was a gossip, my aunt was a gossip. I come from a long line of gossips. I guess I'll always be a gossip. Promised land people do not say, everybody I know is a drunk. I come from a county of drunks. My uncle was a drunk, a family tree of alcoholism. That's going to be me. That's my destiny. You stop that. Just stop that. I mean it. Stop it. You can't think that way as a children of God. People I know in my age are getting older. <laughs> I'm not, but everyone else is. <laughs> It seems like more and more of our conversations sound kind of like, oh, my back hurts. I can hardly walk. Man, my neck, I've got a new ache and pain. I guess I'm just doomed to pass out the rest of my life hurting. Stop that. 
Just stop it. Enough of that. You're a child of God. The Holy Spirit indwells you. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. He remakes you every day. His mercies are new every morning. You don't give in. You don't give in. You do not assume. You do not assume that tomorrow is going to be difficult. You assume that tomorrow is going to be victorious. Just assume it. Expect it. Not because you deserve it, but because you've been bought by Christ. I don't know what he saw in you that was worth buying. I don't know what he saw worth in me. But that's his decision, not mine. So I've been bought by Christ. That means I'm indwelt by Christ. That means I have access to the very power of Christ. And we begin to live out of our inheritance, not out of our circumstance. There was absolutely no reason for Joshua to think he could bring down the walls of Jericho. What was there? They had never fought a battle like that. They'd been the last 40 years wandering in the desert, eating the same manna and quail every day. They had never done that. But Joshua said, well, okay, God, you said you've already taken that city. I assume it's coming down. And he pressed forward in faith. And then he went to the soldiers and he said, all right, it's time for battle. I would imagine they started grabbing their swords and their spears, getting everything ready. And he said, well, God has a different strategy. And the general outlined the most unlikely of attacks in verse 6. Joshua said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. So Joshua commanded the soldiers to march before and behind the priests. And he told the trumpets that told the priests to blow trumpets, uh, ram's horns continuously as they marched around the city once a day. Look what he told the rest of the people. He said, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice. Nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, and then you shall shout. We're talking here about a population of two million people. This isn't a first grade class of 30 kids. We're talking about a city. We're talking about a battalion of 40,000 soldiers. So Joshua instructs these two million people to watch from a distance. Most of the 40,000 soldiers are also going to watch from a distance. He selects an entourage of priests and soldiers, and he instructs them to march around the city to carry in their midst the Ark of the Covenant, the precious relic of ancient Israel, which was the dwelling place of God. He puts a priest, puts priests in front and priests behind it to carry it, soldiers in front and soldiers behind. He takes two million plus people, tells them to stand off to the side. He tells them, zip it. Isn't that interesting? Don't say a word. Why? The only sound that is allowed to be heard in the air is the blasting of ram's horns. No hand-to-hand -hand combat. No war cries, no spears, no ladders, no catapults. What kind of warfare is this? This is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. Every battle of your life and mine is at its root a spiritual war. Every temptation that comes into your life is there because there is a real devil and this devil is a liar. And his days are numbered. And he's in a bad mood. And he knows he's going to be cast into a pit. And heaven is going to be heavenly because he will be absent. But until that day, he's going to tell every lie. He's going to bring down every saint that he possibly can. He has no desire to do anything for you except evil. Evil. He knows your name. And he knows where you live. And he desires to do nothing, but he, he traffics in deceit like a meth dealer traffics in dope. He passes it out. And he does nothing but lie. Jesus said he's the father of lies. He's never spoken a word of truth. His ploy is to lie to you, to get lies inside your head. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. As Christians, we do not obsess ourselves with the devil. We do not. We do not obsess ourselves with darkness, with the cults, with demonic presence, with principalities. We don't obsess ourselves with trying to figure out who they are. What we do is we focus on Christ. We focus on Christ. We glance at the devil, but we focus on Christ. But we are not so naive as to think that all of this is a material battle. It's not. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual conflict. And we're caught up in the middle of it. And we're followers of the great King of Kings, the victor, Jesus Christ. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we are wise to learn how to engage in spiritual battle as our Lord has taught us to do so. This is how Jericho walls come down. The Apostle Paul does not call our Jerichos Jerichos. He calls them strongholds. In 2 Corinthians 10.3, he says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down what? strongholds. Just as Jericho was a stronghold that had to come out in order for Joshua to march in, there are strongholds in your life that need to come down so you can march in. Now, our strongholds are not made out of bricks. Our strongholds are made out of thoughts, out of philosophies and opinions. We learn this from the Apostle Paul. He says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So a stronghold is an argument. It's a philosophy. It's an opinion. It's a precept. Any high thing, it sounds lofty, but it sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Does a stronghold have a stronghold on you? Maybe you've heard some of these strongholds. Maybe you've had them. God could never forgive me. That's, that's evidence of a stronghold. The person who says God could never forgive me is living in the shadow of a Jericho. That's a stronghold of guilt. I could never forgive that person. I could never forgive them. That's a stronghold of resentment. We know it's a stronghold because that's a lie. I'm not saying it'd be easy to forgive that person, but you could. By the power of God, you could. But if you don't think you could, then that's a stronghold that's keeping you from moving forward in your faith. Bad things always happen to me. That's a stronghold. That's a lie. Bad things don't always happen to you. But if that is a part of your belief system, if you filter your decisions through that conviction, bad things always happen to me, then you're living in the shadow of a Jericho and it's keeping you from moving forward in your faith. I must be good or God will reject me. Well, that's a stronghold of performance. My value equals my possessions. Boy, there's a strong stronghold. I'm only as good as the car that I drive or the house in which I live or the clothes that I wear. I'm better if I have more. That's a stronghold of materialism. Strongholds are lies. They're just lies. They're deceitful lies that come from the source of all lies, the devil. In the first step in bringing down your stronghold is saying, Lord, what strongholds are in my life? What strongholds right now are in my life? And you listen, and the Lord Jesus will reveal that to you. And I believe he's also revealed to us through the study of Joshua how those strongholds come down. So just quickly, look what Joshua did. He put God right in the center. He put the Ark of the Covenant right in the center of this entourage. He didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, which was the dwelling place of God. He didn't have the Ark of the Covenant back behind the two million people, right? He put the Ark of the Covenant right in the center of the people. You do the same when you put God right in the center of your life, when you put him right in the center of your marriage, right in the center of your finances, right at the beginning of your week. You do the same when you put God right in the center of your sex life, right in the center of your uh, health and activities. When you allow God to have domain in every, you don't compartmentalize God. You don't say, okay, this is my, 
material life, and this is my spiritual life. You let God have domain over everything. I talked with a lady recently who said, I started using my 90-minute commute to work every morning as a time of worship. She said, when I get in my car, I enter my car as if I'm entering a sanctuary. And I believe that the highway is my time to be in the presence of God. And for 90 minutes, I, I love this phrase, I marinate my mind with worship music, with scriptures. I listen to my favorite preachers. I didn't ask her if I was one of them. <laughs> 90 minutes, she said, and by the time I get out of my car, I'm refreshed. And I'm ready to go. What is she doing? She's putting the Ark of the Covenant right in the middle. And you know what else she's doing? She's blasting the ram's horn. Now, this is interesting. In ancient Israel, there were two types of horns. The silver trumpet that would be used to assemble people for a gathering. And the ram's horn would be used to declare the protection and the provision of God. It was a worship instrument. So when they declared the ram's horn, they were declaring, God will provide, God will win. God will provide, God will win. Now, where do you get these ram's horns? Do they sell them at Costco or at, at Sam's? Your ram's horn is scripture. Your ram's horn is scripture. Satan will not linger where truth is told. Satan will not linger where truth is told. He will not loiter where God is praised. Mark that down. He will not linger where truth is told. He will not loiter where God is praised. So do you want Satan to be gone? You do what Jesus did in the wilderness. You quote scripture. It is that simple. Satan has an allergy to truth. He has to leave. He cannot stand it. So if your stronghold is anxiety, when you feel yourself getting anxious, Instead of giving in to that anxiety and going down, down, down into the quagmire of worry and fear, take a stand against it. Rise up against it. Pull a scripture out of your book. Pull it out. It's the sword of the Spirit, right? The Word of God. So you pull it out and you hold it up and you say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And you begin quoting this scripture out loud, out loud. Satan cannot read your thoughts. He's just an angel. But boy, he can hear your words. So you quote it out loud. I do this often at night. Sometimes I have trouble falling asleep. I don't know if you do. And sometimes when I have difficulty falling asleep, my thoughts will turn anxious because my filter is down. I'm a little bit tired. And so out there on my pillow, I'll have to pop my eyes open and say something like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I just declare that right there in the room, in the hotel room, wherever I am. And I'm not sure what happens in the supernatural, but I believe something happens in the supernatural right then. Because why? Because we're blasting the ram's horn. We're blasting the ram's horn. We cannot overestimate also the importance of what you're doing here when you come together for corporate worship. When you allow your worship leaders to lead you into the presence of Christ and we all stand up with one voice, don't you know that any demon in this area banishes, escapes, turns, and runs? Right now, this is the safest place in the city. Why? Because we're collecting our hearts in corporate worship, making loud, proud proclamation of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? These are ram's horn declarations. We use scripture. We use prayer. We use worship. This is spiritual warfare. This is Christianity 101. <laughs> this is meat and potatoes. This is blocking and tackling. This is just the raw stuff that we Christians do. And we can all do this because we all have scripture. We all have prayer. And we can all worship. Not everybody can sing as well as others. Not everybody memorizes passages as easily as others. Not everybody seems to have the same prayer passion. But you know what? We can all do something. And you can do this. You can do this. And as you do, these Jericho walls are going to start coming down. A lady came up to me recently at our service in San Antonio and asked if I would pray for her eight-year-old son. He was passing through a time of fear. He was having trouble sleeping. Even at the young age of eight, he was beginning to see visions that were keeping him awake at night. 
And so we prayed. I took him back in the prayer room. I told him what I've been telling you, that every battle is ultimately, or at its root, is a spiritual battle. And that a real battle is not flesh against flesh and blood, but it's against the devil. And that the real battle is fought here between our ears and what we think. Because the devil's always whispering lies. And so I told him that just because you have a thought, you don't have to think it. Just because you have a thought, you don't have to think it. And I said, whenever there's a thought that comes that brings you fear, you reach up and you take it out. And I gave him an exercise that I used to give my own children when they were small. I said, just take your hand, grab that thought, pull it out, and throw it in the trash. And then replace that thought with the truth. And I gave him a Bible verse to memorize. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Just that much. And so instead of going down that thought trail that the devil brings, you go down a truth trail. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We prayed for him, anointed him with oil. His mom sent me this email a few days later. Since last week, the images are gone. He's no longer seeing them. He's doing well in school. He's enjoying reading the book of Genesis. God gave us Psalm 25, 5 to memorize. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you. The, you are the God of my salvation. On you I'll wait all the day. And he recites this verse every night. This has brought him closer to Christ. He uses the strategy of throwing the fearful thoughts away in the trash can. I asked, what made the thoughts go away? He said, God made them go away. <laughs> and another Jericho bites the dust. This is how victory happens. Little by little, thought by thought, day by day, word by word, scripture by scripture, thought by thought, day by day, word by word, scripture by scripture. Sometimes we have massive victories, but most of the days it's just this step-by-step -step decision that today I'm going to take every thought captive and I'm going to bring it into the presence of God. And as we do, those Jerichos begin to crumble. That's what happened in the story of Joshua. I closed my book too soon. Let's see how it ends. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 15. On the seventh day they rose early about the dawning of the day and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the, blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat and then the people took the city. And the very walls that had kept them out became stepping stones over which they could climb. Does a stronghold have a stronghold on you? May the Lord reveal it to you. Are you living out of your circumstance or out of your inheritance? May he reveal to you your inheritance. Are you stuck in the dry lands of the wilderness rather than the glory days, the promised land of the King of Kings? Then this is your day. This is your day that you're going to begin moving forward into a new victorious season of life. And may God bless you. And I'll be looking for you in the promised land. Thank you, Lord, for your good word, for the blessings of Jesus Christ, our King of Kings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.